All right, guys, it's time for the next level guy show, a men's interview, interest, and improvement focused podcast featuring interviews with the greats from all industries to help you better your life. Each week, a new episode features an interview with one of the greats covering all aspects of their story from life hacks to tips and protocols that have allowed them to live life on the next level. We then highlight concrete action steps that you can use to improve your life. And now, your host, Ian Dawson McKay. And today's guest is one of my favorite people, Josh Settledge. Josh, or Coach Jay, has spent over a decade studying grappling sports and human performance, working with and learning from the best minds in physical therapy, biomechanics, strength and conditioning. He studied kinesiology with a concentration in exercise science at William Jessup University and is a certified strength and conditioning specialist within the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Coach Jay has studied under and worked alongside world record holders in powerlifting, professional bodybuilders, NCAA wrestling All-Americans and national champions. He's also worked with IBJJF Worlds and Pan Am champions. Coach Jay has worked with high school and college wrestlers across the country and many more jiu-jitsu athletes across the world. His unique blend of knowledge in strength and conditioning and his experience in the mat provide him with the tools necessary to help all his athletes win more matches and get injured less. And in this interview, which is our round two, we discuss how to build your ability to squat better, pull up stronger, and move in general better. We look at how you should adapt your training to your experience and personality type to excel in your training, a breathing hack that can save your relationships as much as your ability to roll better, and so much more. And now, let's get to the interview. Thank you so much for coming back on. You know, usually I say thanks for it, but I have to say welcome back. It's a joy to have you back on, and it's been. It feels like it's been too long, but like we said, it's been what feels like a couple of years, but it's been a couple of months. Just for those who maybe don't recognize the name, before you become a juggernaut in the jujitsu scene, can you give a quick introduction? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Ian, for having me back on. The last time we had a conversation, I had so much freaking fun. So I'm glad that we were able to do this again. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Josh Selledge. I am the BJJ Strength Coach. I run my own company, Settledge Strength, and where our main focus and our main goal is to help as many grappling athletes as possible win more matches and get injured less. And we do that with a training system we designed called the Strength Matrix, which essentially is our site where it houses different training programs for strength and conditioning that are specifically designed to answer all the questions that so many jiu-jitsu athletes have about strength and conditioning. How do you get in shape for jiu-jitsu? How do you improve mobility? How do you prepare for a competition? Not just you know, do the technical training on the mat with your instructor and with your training partners, but how do you build conditioning to do well in competition? How do you make your body more resilient so you can decrease the risk of injury? That's what we focus on. And that's what I've been doing for shoot, probably a little over five years now. And uh, that's what I'm all about. Love it. And you're absolutely killing it. And I think that's, you were one of the first people I ever found who looked at jujitsu in this in-depth way and this kind of in-detailed way. Because I, I like how in your, and I had to, to just find it, you mentioned on your website, your program's specialty is helping athletes increase their muscular and contractile and isometric strength, anaerobic and aerobic endurance and blood lactate threshold. <laughs> and I was like, I understand all those words. I was like, how do I apply into jiu-jitsu? And I love, because each time I watch your videos, I learn so much, but how can we start implementing them into a grappler's performance? How do we start turning somebody into a, yeah, train jiu-jitsu into a, a jiu-jitsu monster? Sure, absolutely. Well, as as you know, jiu-jitsu is an extremely physical sport and It doesn't help that despite it being so extremely physical, the main goal of jujitsu is to um, do the opposite of what our bodies are naturally designed to do. So that being said, there is a lot of wear and tear that happens in jujitsu. And a lot of times people get really passionate about jujitsu and they start training more often. They start training a little bit harder, but oftentimes they don't have a good resource or a good uh, system 
to allow them to do more jujitsu and to perform better. They'll go online and look up workouts and maybe it's a classic bodybuilding style training program or a powerlifting style training program, which I love those things. And I've done hundreds probably at this point of powerlifting programs and bodybuilding programs. But those programs are assuming that you're not getting banged up at jujitsu. And so it's very important that we mm-hmm. start to look at different things in the different physical and physiological demands of jujitsu and design our training in a way that's going to allow us to not only enhance our performance on the mat by being stronger, which means all the techniques that we do, we're going to have a little bit more force, a little bit more pop to them, but also making sure that we're increasing our physical durability. That way, things like our neck, our shoulders, our knees, our hips, our elbows, all those things are starting to just be a little bit more resistant to injury. Of course, there's no 100% guarantee that you're not going to get injured in a sport like jujitsu. But if we can decrease that risk of injury as much as possible, that's going to definitely help us out in the long run. And then as well as the conditioning side of jujitsu, everybody knows that the conditioning needed for jujitsu is very unique. And you can come into the sport of jujitsu with a great background in running or or maybe you're a swimmer or maybe you uh, did a bunch of 5Ks. That's great until you actually start rolling in jujitsu and then you realize very quickly that – the conditioning is way different. And so there needs to be a very specific way that we condition to increase our blood lactate threshold. And essentially your blood lactate threshold is your red line. You think about an engine in a car and on the dash, you have your RPMs. You could go, you know, for pretty fast for a long ways underneath that red line section of that RPM dial. But once you start to get into that red line zone, you can only hang on to that for a while before the engine fails, before you start to, you know, from a physical perspective, you're pushing that really, really high pace. You can only maintain that for a brief period of time before everything starts to shut down. And then your pace starts to slow down. You start to feel gassed out. You start to, um, you know, people use the term red line a lot, or they just you know, get broken basically in a match because they hit that threshold and they can't recover and get back to, working at a high work rate. So doing certain types of conditioning training that increases our blood lactate threshold is going to be very important to enhance our overall performance in jujitsu. And that's something that at least everyone that's involved in my company prides themselves prides, prides themselves on is just being able to help as many grappling athletes get in better shape. So yeah, our performance will improve. We'll be better at doing jujitsu, but most importantly, we'll be in healthier shape and more physically resilient so we can do more jujitsu for longer periods of time not everyone is going to be a super serious competitor which is totally fine mm-hmm. but everyone that does jujitsu and has fallen in love with jujitsu i'm sure would love to do jujitsu as long as possible and if there are things that we can do outside the mats that are going to contribute to us being able to do jujitsu later in our in our years later in age and kind of stay healthy as we're progressing in jujitsu, it's just going to benefit everybody at that point. I love it. Cause that is something I definitely noticed was every time you looked at a training program, it was like such a high volume, such a high intensity. And I thought, how do you fit that in with jujitsu? You know, you're getting battered and bruised. And then they're saying to you, go and lift one rep maxis, go on, you know, and you're just like, I can't even think about that. Never mind doing it. But for those people who are listening, what's like a physical set of benchmarks for an average, we'll call them a hobbyist, what should we be looking to strive like? Is there certain deadlift max reps? Is there certain squats? Is there certain level of flexibility, mobility? What would you want your athletes as a sort of standard gauge to have? Is yeah, there such a thing? A- absolutely, yeah. So I, I released a, a podcast episode on my podcast, the Strength Matrix podcast, where we went over some of these markers and some of these strength metrics that uh, you can kind of shoot for as like some healthy goals to have, as well as some bare minimums. Like, hey, if you're doing jujitsu at an absolute minimum, you should be able to complete this amount of reps for this exercise, this uh, percentage of your body weight for this exercise. And so there is quite a long list. But for starters, if we look at kind of some big movements that every human should be able to do every human should be able to squat so I, for every jiu-jitsu athlete you should be able to get to a point where you could sit in the bottom of a squat for about 10 minutes comfortably it's maybe not going to be the most comfortable thing maybe you you know you start to um 
have a little bit of burn sitting in the bottom of that squat position, but it shouldn't be excessively painful. If you need to hang on to something to balance as you sit in that squat, that's fine. But if you can sit in a squat for about 10 minutes or work up to sitting into the bottom of a squat for 10 minutes of unbroken time, that means that your ankle mobility is pretty solid. That means that your hip and knee stability is pretty good and on point. That's also going to mean that your upper back stability or your postural strength is going to be solid as well. You mentioned deadlift, which is one of my favorite exercises of all time. For any jiu-jitsu athlete in any weight class at a base level, every jiu-jitsu athlete should be able to safely and successfully deadlift their body weight. I'd say it's probably a little bit of a better goal to shoot for about double body weight. Depending on how big you are, that's definitely going to make things uh, much more difficult. If someone is, say, you know, 300 pounds, going for a 600 pound deadlift is a very big endeavor. But that may be a sign. It's like, okay, well, if you are 300 pounds and you're doing jujitsu, it may be beneficial to start decreasing body fat. Maybe work to a little bit more of a healthier uh, body fat percentage range. And then on the bottom side of things, if you're 100 pounds. Doing a 200-pound deadlift may be pretty aggressive, especially if someone's 200 pounds. And so if you want to increase your body weight a little bit, pack on a little bit more muscle, sure, that may take things. If you go from 100 pounds to like 135 pounds, that then pushes your deadlift requirement to be from 200 pounds to 260 pounds. But you have that added muscle mass. You're able to uh, move a little bit better. You are much stronger. So that's where I would put things at at a deadlift. Some other things that I look at, especially with the athletes that I work with, is I'm huge on pull-ups and for an upper body test. At a bare minimum, every jiu-jitsu athlete should at least get to a point where they're able to do 10 solid pull-ups. Pull-ups, chin-ups, you know, I'm a fan of of – pull-ups and in chin-ups together. So I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other. So mm -hmm. if people prefer to have a chin-up grip, that's fine. If, if some people like to do a pull-up grip, that's fine too. But that's a good test in not only just for upper body strength, but also just to know that your shoulders are healthy, your elbows are healthy, uh, your bicep tendon, which you know in arm bars gets stretched out a ton. Uh, it's just a good test to make sure all those things are rock solid. So there's a lot of different tests, Ian, that I have and a lot of different assessments that I'll take certain athletes through. But from a lower body perspective, I would say, you know, make sure your mobility is in check by working up to being able to sit into the bottom of a squat for about 10 minutes, a lower body test of strength. And, you know, you do use a lot of your upper body for stability when you're doing the deadlift at a bare minimum, get to about a body weight deadlift, but a good goal to shoot for would be a double body weight deadlift. And then for some upper body strength and some upper body uh, local muscular endurance, getting 10 body weight pull-ups is a great goal to shoot for as well. I was I was agreeing with all of it till you got to the pull-ups and then I thought, oh no, because <laughs> I find, because you see that is a lot of people struggle with push-ups pull-ups with like all the basic kind of you know tense your body embrace the core how do you yep. work with people to actually get them to a point where you know we're not trying the silly kip-up stuff we're we're actually embracing it the mind muscle connection the full range of motion how do you get people into just right form rather than leave the ego aside let's get into back to the basics how would you break it down for a, a jiu-jitsu newbie who's wanting to get to the gym and pack on a few pounds? Because that's something I hear a lot of people saying is, I wouldn't have a clue what to do in the gym. How do they get just yeah. the feel of the weight, the, you know, the control of the weight, I suppose? Is a sure. Absolutely. So for pull-ups, I'm a big fan of just doing dead hangs, like just literally just hanging from a pull-up bar. And what's great about that is that it helps open up the shoulders, which a lot of times people struggle with pull-ups because they have some sort of shoulder mobility restriction. If your shoulder gets really tight and it's you're not only having to lift your body weight, but you also have to work against the stiffness in the poor mobility of the shoulder. So if we can start by opening everything up, opening up the lats, opening up the shoulder, okay. as well as improving grip strength, that's a great place to start. And then from there, you could work through a couple of different progressions of doing some, uh, I like I like to call them just uh, like shoulder scap raises. So you're basically just flexing your shoulders and kind of engaging your lats a little bit. It's kind of like a 
the most partial range of motion pull up you've ever seen. You're not even <laughs> bending the elbows. You're just engaging the muscles of your back. So I'll have athletes start with that either as part of a warm up or maybe they do a few working sets of that. And then to start building the strength side of things of the actual pull down movement. I'm a big fan of cable machines and I'm a big fan of doing something like the lat pull down. I just posted a video actually today on my Instagram about something you can do to change things up on the lat pull down exercise to have a little bit better of a carryover to your pull up game. And it's actually to face outside of the machine. So most traditional lat pull down machines, mm -hmm. you have a bench and then there's some pads where you're able to wedge your knees underneath and then you can reach up, grab the, the pull down uh, handles and start doing your lat pull downs. I've done lat pull downs that way for years and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But if you're looking for the lat pull down to have a good transfer and carry over to your pull ups, it's a little bit better if you flip things around and you face outside. So that way you aren't able to lock your knees under that pad. And what that forces you to do is that forces you to stabilize your core and your trunk a lot more. And then you're limited by how much weight you can pull on the lat pull down. Because if you start to pull more than your body weight, then you're just going to pull yourself up off the, off the seat. And so you can have a better progression and, and a good way of measuring how much stronger you're getting in your ability to do a strict pull down. I weigh about 160 pounds. If I was working up to being able to do some full range of motion pull-ups, I would say like, okay, I'm going to start at 80 pounds facing outside the lat pull-down machine. Once I can get about a, a, like two or three sets of 10 to 15 reps of 80 pounds, I'm going to increase it. I'm going to go 95, maybe even 100 pounds. And I'm going to keep doing that until I can get to about where I'm able to do 160 pound or 150 pound lat pull downs for about 10 reps. Once I'm there, I've built up the stability in my upper back. I've built up the strength in my upper back and my arms to where I could start working on doing full range of motion pull-ups hanging from the bar. So that's how I would progress and kind of introduce someone to doing pull-ups. Another big exercise that I'm a huge fan of that's a little bit different than the pull-up is going to be the inverted row or the body weight row. It's kind of like a horizontal pull-up. You can place a barbell in a squat rack or a and a bench rack and you're going to be pulling yourself to the bar but instead of it being a vertical pull where you're reaching over your head and then pulling your head or your chin over the bar it's going to be horizontal so you're going to be pulling your arms at your sides pulling your chest up to touch the bar at the top and that's another great exercise to develop upper back strength grip strength you can build a lot of great local muscular endurance in that hanging position kind of feeling the pressure of gravity in your hands and in your arms so those two things you know progressing on lat pull downs and then also doing some body weight rows i'd say are some good options for someone to introduce themselves when they start to go to the gym and start working on pull-ups i love it because that is something I struggled with, you know, was that moment of like, how do I get my fat ass up and do it regularly? And it got to a point where I was doing like a bar above the door and I do one as a pat went in mm. just to get the, I think it's yeah. like the frequency and just to try to build myself in. Inverted rows are amazing. Best, one of the best exercises. And you never see guys doing them. You know, they've yeah. got the belt on and they're doing, and it's all the crappy range of motion. And like, see tonight I was in jujitsu guy was trying to do um we're trying to escape out of like side control and he couldn't get explosive hips you know he couldn't just push himself mm. up he couldn't frame and hold like people who weren't mm. really pushing into them out how do you start building the body because i love in your instagram you look at improving the body and fixing the issues and the muscle like you know the shoulder the knees and all that as much as the jiu-jitsu how do you start working on producing control for frames for, you know, like tightening of the legs for half guard, all these kind of things so we can actually feel our body and use it? Is it a way to do that? There, there is. And I think there's, there's two different approaches that I've taken. And if someone is a, a brand, they're brand new to jujitsu and they're also brand new to lifting. The great thing about them being a total beginner in both of those avenues is that as they get more experienced in lifting, they're already going to be much more, they're going to be getting a lot stronger and that's going to help their jujitsu. 
just mm-hmm. doing a squat, whether that's having a bar on your back, whether that's doing a goblet squat where the weight's in front, whether if you have a belt squat machine where you wear a belt around your waist and clip the weight into your belt, all the muscles that are involved in your guard game or in half guard where you're squeezing your legs together and stabilizing those positions, or if you're opening your legs up for guard retention, you're using all of those muscles when you're working through movements like the squat. A lot of the movements where you're squeezing down triangles or arm bars and using a lot of your posterior chain on things like guard passes, you do work those muscles a lot when you're doing things like sled drags, deadlifts, lunges, things like that. So we do see a lot of improvement in jujitsu just by simply getting stronger. However, everybody's newbie gains start to diminish at a certain point. And so Mm -hmm. after that, it's important that we look at different weaknesses that a certain athlete has on the mat and find different ways to develop those. You brought up a great point about someone uh, in the training room struggling with having explosive hips. If that's a, a weakness that someone has, there could be a technical thing. So maybe they're being explosive at just the wrong time. They're exploding when it's kind of the worst possible time to be explosive when all the weight is on top of them. And that could be a, a tactical weakness where they have the explosive hips, but they just always use it at the wrong time. And that's why it's not effective. It could be a technical weakness. So they can move their body, but they're not putting themselves in the right position to be able to do that move correctly. Um, There's a lot of great moves on YouTube and I'm sure, you know, Ian, if you're like me, you've probably seen like a really cool move on YouTube and you're like, man, I'm going to try that in class today. Mm -hmm. And you try it the first time and it doesn't work. And, you know, maybe it's a, it's a complete hoax of a move, but in today's day and age, there's so many valid and viable techniques. Most of the time, the, the only reason it didn't work is because we, our technique just wasn't fully dialed in yet. So those are the tactical weaknesses and then the technical weaknesses. Then if we have a physical weakness, then we can start highlighting and prescribing certain exercises to improve that component on the mat. So a full hip extension or, or a full bridge or being explosive with the hips is going to be a weakness. Some great exercises that are going to help with that is just going to be improving hip extension strength and movements like the squat and the deadlift. And then to be more specific on the explosive power side of things, movements like kettlebell swings, broad jumps, box jumps. Um, If someone is proficient in kettlebell cleans or kettlebell snatches, those are also some great exercises that they can do to get more explosive hips. So to kind of circle back to your original question on how we start to improve someone's strength specifically for jujitsu, Thankfully, the lifting that we do is going to improve their overall strength, improve their overall explosiveness, which when we funnel it into specific positions on the mat, that's going to be helpful. Those are kind of like the newbie gains side of things. Then from there, we're able to dial things in more specifically to someone's game, to the certain techniques that someone likes to use. Um, One example, you know, using myself as an example, for me, I, I realized that, okay, I was plenty strong. I was plenty explosive, but I kept running into this issue where if I was trying to uh, finish someone in a triangle, in the first, like in a triangle choke, in the first round of training class, I could I could finish and be just fine. But if so, if someone was able to escape, I would finish that round, the first round, fine. But then when I go into the second training round, my legs would start to cramp up, and so I had the strength, I had the explosiveness. I had the local muscular endurance when I wasn't squeezing as hard as I could, but when I had to squeeze as hard as I could, I couldn't recover very well and I couldn't recover fast or as fast as I would have liked. And so what I did was I had to implement some very specific training tools where we were doing some long isometric holds for about 30 seconds. We were mixing in some pre-fatigue sets where we would uh, pre-fatigue the muscle with a high rep set of, of 20 reps or so. And then we would go into an isometric hold to get used to being able to hold that contraction under fatigue. Ran that for about three weeks, had some amazing results. Thankfully, my legs aren't cramping up anymore at jujitsu. And not only that, but they've gotten way stronger as well. And, you know, lots of like knee pain that I was dealing with started to go away. So there's a lot of different avenues that we can take and in, in dialing in some very specific uh, attributes for jujitsu. I mean, answers like that is why I knew I had to get you back on because it's just like, 
this guy knows his shit. He's amazing. And it's things like that that could change somebody, you know, like coming into jujitsu from the start. I had to actually stop myself from taking notes just now. You know, I was just like, oh, yeah, I'm doing an interview. Because that's why I find hey, no worries. I, I find your stuff so engaging and it's so helpful because I asked that in jujitsu one day and they said, oh, more time on the mat. It's a standard approach. And it's like, we don't get that teaching. We don't get that kind of you know, like you're saying, fatiguing the muscle and then doing sets of it and working in the, you know, going to the gym. We just get told, get stronger. And it's, yeah. why do you think that is? Like, why is there such a kind of, is it because strength's bad and we shouldn't be doing strength? Why do we kind of push away from looking at the biochemics of movement, application of strength? You know, because you're needing to use strength in a correct way to choke somebody out. You're needing to use strength to hold somebody, to frame something. Why is that not part of jujitsu teaching, do you think? I think there's a couple of different answers. And I think if you asked someone 30 years ago, it would be a very different answer than how I would answer today. Um, 30 years ago, when jujitsu was first popping off uh, in the UFC and in those early days, Strength was a little bit bastardized, and jujitsu kind of looked at was known as like a, a martial art where you don't need strength, you could just use super sound technique. A smaller guy would easily mm -hmm. be able to defeat a bigger guy. Look at Hoist Gracie in the UFC, and those are all some very valid points until equal skill, equally skilled grapplers who did lift and were stronger started to piece up grapplers who didn't lift. And so that's one side of things. And I think over the years, most people at this point, I've started to recognize like, look, strength isn't a bad thing. Strength isn't something that should be bastardized. We still, you know, part of the, I'd say one knock on the jujitsu community is that there's still not a good consensus on how to train for jujitsu. And that's kind of my mission right now is to help as many grappling athletes, not only get stronger and get more explosive and better conditions so they can perform better, but also to educate them because so many jujitsu athletes and kind of the trajectory of jujitsu is if you are so passionate and in love with jujitsu, you're going to get to a point where you hit, re, go through all the different belt levels, you reach black belt, and then you start teaching. And if we can start to equip all these instructors with new education on how to effectively do the physical side of the strength and conditioning work for jujitsu, it's going to benefit everybody. And so I think now the, the part of the biggest reason why uh, most people's answers in regards to strength and conditioning about jujitsu, it's not necessarily because they don't think it's valuable. I think everyone can agree that being stronger and being better conditioned is a valuable thing, but most people aren't as passionate about it to dive deep into the research and dive deep into the text about what's actually going to help. Um, I know for me, uh, my wife and I both uh, run our own companies, and I am not very passionate about taxes or finances <laughs> or any me. of that stuff. Any of that stuff, I it I like have the hardest time focusing on that thing, on those things. My wife, on the other hand, does actually have a passion for those things, and she's very skilled in that area. Now, I'm not going to say that like, nah, taxes aren't important. Filing, you know, all these forms the right way. That's you know, that's hocus pocus. That's that's not important. I understand the value of that. I just don't have the passion to dive into those subjects like maybe my wife does. And so I think a lot of these instructors, they see the value of strength training. They see the value of having sound conditioning training, but they're just not passionate enough to dedicate the last you know 12 plus years like I have to learning this stuff. Thankfully, I have a deep-rooted passion for strength and conditioning, and I have a deep-rooted passion for grappling sports, specifically jujitsu. So it works out well in my favor that I'm going to be learning this stuff anyway, regardless if I got paid for it, regardless if, you know, we were doing a, a conversation about it today, I'm going to be reading and learning all this stuff anyway. I'm just happy that I get to share it with everybody. And so I think that's kind of the, the thing that we're running into. And you can't blame most of these instructors for not being as passionate about it as someone else. And that's ultimately how my company got started is i quickly realized that I'm more passionate about the strength and conditioning side of things than most of my training partners. And because I was more passionate about it, they just opted to ask me for uh, of questions. They would say, Hey, like I see you're like always at the gym and like lifting and stuff. Can I ask you a question? Like my knees been bothering me. I don't really know what to do about it. And I, I, I go to jujitsu and I try to take it easy, but sometimes it's still bothering me. Thankfully I'm super passionate about it. So I have an avenue to help them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of the, the main thing is that 
a lot of these instructors, they may see the value of it. They may see that it is important, but they're just not passionate enough about that specific side of training, the strength training, the conditioning training, uh, some of the mobility training. They're not as passionate about those things to invest all the time that's needed to learn about those things and then be able to teach their students. It's time for a quick break. There are millions of potential products to buy, so how do you know which ones are worth your hard-earned money? Simple. You go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and explore those that will transform and improve your life. You'll find deals, listener exclusives, and special offers with some great companies. Recommendations are 100% honest and only on items Ian has tried or believes in. The companies showcased will make you a better man in all areas of your life. Simply go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and level up. Oh, that's a great answer because it was something I noticed when you would look at like jujitsu stuff. It was all technique. It was all half guarded, you know, whereas yours was the first I went into and it was like how to get rid of jujitsu shoulder, how to get rid of elbow pain. You know, it was like, it was also like how to get better and fitter, but for jujitsu, it's for the grappler. It wasn't just five sets of five. And, oh, here we go. Progress. Yeah. You actually went into the nitty gritty. So say you have somebody just now coming in that are white belt, somebody coming in that's a blue belt. Do you focus particular ways, like should the white belt focus on just becoming a better athlete, the blue belt work on their guard and become a better athlete, the purple belt become, you know, X, Y, Z. Do you think there's kind of, as the belt dictates the type of training, the focus of the training and the focus of your strength and conditioning as well? Or is it just a case of mix the both together? I think it, it. I think there's a lot of different factors that go into that. Uh, one thing that's important to note, especially as I've as I've learned um, working with pure white belts. And when I came into jujitsu, I obviously started as a white belt, but I came with a long wrestling background. So not only was my physical conditioning way above most other white belts coming in, but my grappling experience was well above most other grapplers. So I was already used to grappling and I wasn't getting as sore from grappling. And if someone's a pure white belt and they've never done any grappling sport before, it's pretty safe to say that you are going to be very, very sore for the first several weeks, maybe even several months of training jujitsu. Yep. And if that's the case, it, you know, I, I see you raising your hand there. <laughs> if that's the case, it's important to modify your strength and conditioning training around that mm. because Strength and conditioning training may leave you a little bit sore. If you're a black belt, you really don't get that sore from rolling unless you're like in deep, deep, deep trenches of training camp for a big competition. But you can afford to push your strength and conditioning a little bit harder because you're at a point where as a black belt, you're so experienced and so used to doing jujitsu, you're not going to get as sore. If someone is a white belt where they just started jujitsu and they really only have like two months under their belt, they still may be pretty sore after each training session. And so I try to do my best to be careful with how much strength and conditioning training we do because I don't want to make them even more sore with more strength and conditioning work. So for a white belt, I would say at that point, it would be good to focus more so on your mobility, focusing on your GPP or general physical preparedness, just increasing your overall work capacity to do jujitsu. Exercises that aren't gonna bang, uh, bang you up or beat you up too bad. Exercises that are gonna leave you feeling much better after doing them than before you did them. So exercises like sled drags, exercises like uh, do, using lots of bands, so like banded leg curls, banded tricep pushdowns, banded face pulls, even doing things like if you have some odd objects to move around, things like farmer walks or you know push uh, pushing a sled or a mm -hmm. wheelbarrow. Those are all great low intensity, low impact exercises that can help you get stronger and improve your general fitness that aren't going to beat you up too bad as a white belt. Once you get to the blue belt level, you're at a point where, okay, you've been doing jujitsu for probably two, maybe three years. So your body's used to the demands of jujitsu and you're in a much better place to handle more strength and conditioning training. If someone's coming into jujitsu with a large strength and conditioning background, we don't really need to do that per se, mainly because they've already had such a large background of strength and conditioning. They can continue doing their strength and conditioning and just make small tweaks to it to help better apply to their jujitsu training. But we don't necessarily need to be as cautious uh, just starting out. Because it's something that a lot of people I've noticed come in and they go, 
what the hell happened? I went to one session yesterday and I'm in agony. And I kind of sit there and go, yeah, it's <laughs> it's not a normal thing to do, is it? You, you're getting beaten yeah. up. You're running a marathon while you're lying on your back. You're people are choking you and you're it, you know it's you get to a point where your arms going in different directions than it should be and your legs are getting bent back and and then somebody goes do you want to roll and you're like oh for fuck, here we go again so yep. how how do you explain to somebody to because you've said the success of somebody as a grappler is on using your strength to apply your chokes and your grappling techniques but using your conditioning to take them into the deep water so that they get to a point where they, they can't fight back. And How do we do one without buggering the other? How do you take somebody that's raw to it, find their inner bad guy, find their way of using their strength, building their body, but also applying it in a role when they're maybe just a nice guy who's no idea how to be bad? Because suddenly you've got a guy coming flying at you and you're like, fight him back. And you're like, what? Yep. How do you start teaching that, but also using strength and conditioning in a in a proper way? Because it's something I struggled with until I got my blue belt, and even mm. now I go, "Oh, I have to be in the zone." How do you how do sure. you start working with somebody? You know, I think that that side of things is is a lot. Of, it's going to be different for a lot of different individuals, and I think there's a lot of psychology that goes in goes into that. Um, for me coming from a wrestling background, just the way the sport of wrestling is kind of traditionally done is it's very intense and it's very repetitive. It's very monotonous. It's, and it's very, uh, mentally taxing and the pressure of competition in wrestling is very mentally taxing. And so finding that, you know, to use your terminology, finding that bad guy for myself when I started jujitsu wasn't very difficult because, I was kind of forced to do that within wrestling. Now, hmm. someone coming from a different sport or a different activity that doesn't have that, I don't think necessarily they need to force themselves to be the bad guy or force themselves to negotiate with their, their inner bad guy, but they should definitely push themselves beyond levels of discomfort. And they should at some point like find that switch in their mind. You know, uh, my brother, he wrestled also what I, I love him to death. He's one of my best friends in the entire world, but we're very different. Our temperaments are different. The way he goes about things are going to be very different than I would go about things. I get pretty fired up about certain things and, um, maybe act on things a little bit too quickly because I get super excited about them and I just want to pursue them all the way. My brother, on the other hand, he's very cerebral. He takes his time with things. He's very, he's very methodical in what he does and he doesn't do jujitsu. He used to wrestle, but you know, I have a theory that if he did do jujitsu, he would be much more methodical than, and uh, not necessarily slower at jujitsu, but things would have a certain cadence to it that would look different than the way I roll, which can be very explosive because it's a, you know based off my wrestling game. There's a lot of strength involved because that is a, an attribute that I have. And my brother, on the other hand, may be a lot more cerebral and a lot more methodical when he rolls. And so for him, when he's rolling, my suggestion for him would not necessarily to be like, I want you to get mad. I want you to get you know angry when you roll because that may not be the best mindset for him to perform his best. But there should be things where we altered training a little bit and it's like you're going to be stuck on bottom until you can get out. You have to do anything possible to get out of this position. And when you put yourself in drills in certain positions like that, it does force you to dig a little bit deeper and it does force you to get a little bit desperate in your training. And so um, I think like – you know, to circle back, I think there's a lot of psychological components to it that I'm still discovering for myself. And I've seen different people, especially different training partners that I have, I've seen the different ways that they roll. Some of them are really aggressive when they roll. Others are much more laid back and they're equally skilled. So there's not necessarily a clear discrepancy of like, hey, the more aggressive you are, the better uh, you're going to be at jujitsu because I've seen people be successful on both sides. Because I've, I've definitely been interested in it because I was listening to a couple of white belts talk about it today and they were like, I just don't know how to get, I just don't know how to get my killer instinct. And I was like, mm. you don't, you just go in and do the moves and you see the, you know, you see an opening, you go for it. And it kind of got me thinking, it's like, 
that's the thing is a lot of these guys come in, it's tied to their ego, it's tied to their masculinity. They think, I've got to do this. Mm. To, it's You're making me less of a man of a tap. Whereas to me, it's like, all right, I just need to work on that area. I need to work on that position. It's it's really interesting. Like we had one guy who were playing the pod game, you know, where you had like uh, four of you and then as mm. one person would be on the bottom you tap them or they would sweep you and then the next person was straight in and it was to get your conditioning going it was to get like you were saying to put yourself in a position you know in a deep position and he was saying but i couldn't even do anything i just felt claustrophobic i was just on top mm. of you know, i was like what do i do what do i do and he panicked for like i think it was three minutes we had to do which feels a lifetime if you're struggling have yeah. you worked with anybody in overcoming that and creating strong frames to hold people off to actually let them work the technique or do they have to just get used to having a big fat sweaty guy on top of them? Some, <laughs> some of my training partners I have, and with this, you have to be careful, at least in my opinion, with who you're doing it to. And you both, it needs to be consenting on both sides. I would definitely not do this <laughs> me, to anyone. Me too that movement. I, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but so the group of guys that I train with every morning, the AM crew, Almost all of us compete in jiu-jitsu. All of us do jiu-jitsu, and almost mm -hmm. all of us compete in jiu-jitsu. And so there's already an agreement amongst all of us that when we roll, there are going to be days where our number one goal is to just smash each other as hard as we can because we're going to treat it like we would a competition. So we want the pressure to perform to be there. We want the, the competition level speed, the competition level pressure. We want it all to be there. And we all have that agreement with each other. And if someone doesn't have that agreement, that's totally okay. You just might not be the best person to train with us because we have certain goals and things that we're trying to achieve. And it requires that we train this way. Um, so with those guys, I have been in certain positions where we'll do drills. It's like, I'm just going to hold you here as long as I can until that timer runs out. I'm not going to go for many submissions and just try to hold you here as long as I can. And so we'll do that to each other. And we both know what the purpose of that is. And we don't do it all the time, but we're, we both agree to do that. And then there are other training partners that I have that aren't in that core group of guys that I train with. And I'll put them in mount and then I'll let them work out of that position. And then maybe I'll, you know, sweep them and get them, put them back in mount and let them work out of that position again. And so you do have to have a good balance and understanding of who you're training with and what the what your training partner is comfortable with. I will say though, when I was a wrestling coach, because everyone in, who's doing wrestling is competitive and everyone who's doing wrestling is gearing for competition, you can't really, at least in the United States, you can't really sign up for wrestling and then just choose not to compete. You know, if you're signing up for wrestling, you're going to compete. You may not get a mm. ton of matches over the course of a season, but you're at least going to get one match. And we would do drills like this all the time where we would do drills where, Hey, you're going to pin them. You can use any pinning combination you want, and you just have to hold them there for two minutes. And the guy on bottom, you cannot get pinned. You need to do everything shy of poking them in the eye, fish hooking their mouth, or biting them to get off your back. Now, we would do drills like that. I wouldn't say frequently, but probably on a weekly basis. And that really developed that desperation. That really developed that mindset of like, I need to do anything possible to not get pinned. And there have been some amazing stories of coaches that I've met and other wrestlers that I've met that have had that mentality. One, one example is a, a coach that used to be my wrestling coach. And then when I came back to the program and started coaching, he was one of the assistant coaches. He had told me a story where he was a freshman in high school and he had gotten pinned in a match. And he, he swore to himself that he was never going to get pinned ever again. And sure enough, he never got pinned again. Now, he, that didn't mean that he was you know, four-time national champ or anything, but he never lost a match again via pin. And that's, that's inspiring. The, the mental strength that someone has to have mm -hmm. to make that commitment to themselves and stick to that is amazing. And I think everyone can benefit from, some, some, from something like that. And I think especially in jiu-jitsu, it's good to include every once in a while some training like that, even if you're not a competitor, like, look, your partner's just going to hold you in this position. You have to escape. I think that's very a very practical way to train and a very beneficial way to train. But you do need to know the time and place to incorporate that. And, of course, understand and know your training partner. You don't want to 
spring that on them um, as a surprise, especially if they're not a competitor, someone who's not trying to, you know, be a world champ. You definitely don't want to, uh, some middle-aged, you know, some middle-aged older guy be like, what's up dog? Like you're getting it today. You're stuck here. Uh, I think, you know, you have to, uh, be careful with that. Cause it's, you, I do notice it. Like we've got a lot of competitors, but we've also got a lot of gentle souls, shall we call them. And they, sure. kind of, you know, they go under the bottom and it's like, three minutes of them just getting smashed sub again and, and you know they keep coming back and you keep wanting to say to them try this you know like uh, put your frame in bring your knee in, and you're kind of going it's easy if you know what you're doing but if you're holding your breath panicking because this guy's pushing on you and you're like oh what, did I, what have you learned about breathing techniques what have you learned about guys because you know we start off creating a role but as we go into the deeper half as you go into the next match or you know the next drill they start flagging what what have you learned about breathing in terms of conditioning that can help in the gym as well as on the mats is there any kind of hacks that you find that work well yeah absolutely man dude what out i've been talking about this for a couple years now and i wish so badly that i learned about this a decade ago Mm. when i wrestled um I felt like my conditioning was really strong. I remember after a certain, I remember, you know, every year as I continue to learn more about strength and conditioning, continue to get stronger and get better conditioned, my fitness improved tenfold every year. And my junior year, which was my last year of wrestling, I remember getting exhausted and probably only two or three matches. That doesn't mean I won every match. I still definitely got wrecked you know, quite a bit by some good, really good wrestlers, but my condition felt like it was at a point where I wasn't getting exhausted in matches anymore. Maybe yeah, I'd get out of breath or maybe work up a really good sweat, but I wasn't getting exhausted. And then, you know, I take a break from wrestling, start jujitsu. And I work up to having about that level of conditioning again, where I could roll through a whole practice or roll through a whole training session and not really get exhausted. But the thing that made the biggest difference in taking my conditioning to an entirely new level was something that Mark Bell actually told me about. We were training one time early in the morning and he was doing a training session and I, he was uncharacteristically quiet that morning. He just kind of gave me a head nod and was doing his thing. I was on the other side of the gym. And then when I walked over to him to talk to him, I noticed he had a piece of tape over his mouth and that's why he wasn't saying anything. And uh, I asked him like, what's up with the tape? And so he was telling me about it. He was focusing on nasal breathing and Mm -hmm. he turned me on to a guy named Patrick McEwen. And Patrick McEwen has done a ton of research and coaching and has a whole book called the oxygen advantage written about the importance and benefits of nasal breathing. And so when you're breathing, regardless if you're exercising, doing jujitsu, um, going through, you know, throughout your everyday life, sleeping, when you nasal breathe, breathing exclusively in and out of your nose, not only are those breaths more efficient, so you use less energy to intake that great amount of oxygen, you're going to intake more oxygen than if you breathe through your mouth. And that oxygen is going to get filtered much better. And you're going to be able to deliver that oxygen throughout the body much more efficiently. So there's just a huge upside to focusing on nasal breathing. That's just kind of the everyday normal living stuff. But then when you focus on the conditioning side of things and you do very specific conditioning training with nasal breathing, you're able to increase your level of conditioning before you hit that red line phase by a long shot. So I was, I felt like I was in really good shape and I felt like, you know, I could roll well and and not get as tired. But once I started nasal breathing, everything changed in everything from how long I was able to roll, how hard I was able to roll and maintain that pace over multiple rounds, all of those things improved. And so if there's one trick or one, um, you know, secret at this point, I don't think it's much of a secret. I've been trying to tell as many people about it as possible, (laughs) but if there's one trick that I would suggest to improve and focus on breathing when it comes to jujitsu is to focus on nasal breathing. And I'm not going to say it's easy because it was pretty difficult for me at first. It took me about a month of really focusing and really practicing. Like every time I realized I was breathing with my mouth open, I'm like, close my mouth, start breathing through my nose again. And for it is going to mess with your rolling a little bit because if you've never tried it before, you can't roll that hard 
breathing in and out of your nose. You have to bring your pace mm. down. But there is a benefit to that as well because it does give you a little bit more time to think. It does help you kind of focus and calm down. Think about like, okay, what's my next move going to be? So I would highly suggest incorporating some form of nasal breathing while you're doing your drilling techniques uh, and during your live rolls. Of course, during your live rolls, it's going to be harder to do that. If you're going to the gym to do some very specific conditioning work, I would also suggest doing forms of nasal breathing. This is something that myself and the AM crew does about twice a week. We do very, we do different forms of conditioning depending on what our training goals are and what competitions we're preparing for. But almost any conditioning that we do, we always do it with either a small piece of tape over our mouth to focus okay. on nasal breathing. Or if we don't put tape on our mouth, we just, you know, make sure that everyone's keeping their mouth shut while they're doing the, the conditioning work. And it has done wonders for me is from a conditioning perspective. Another big benefit of nasal breathing, or at least using mouth tape, is to wear it while you sleep. Um, I stopped snoring. My sleep improved a ton. I know my wife definitely appreciates uh, me nasal breathing throughout the <laughs> night. Um so it's, I mean, that would be like my number one suggestion, man, is, is to uh, get into some nasal breathing. My ex would love to, if I did that, because I, <laughs> apparently I snored for Scotland. I mean, is, oh, do, you th- man. do you think that would help people then like actually calm enough to see what's happening in the role, T- to not panic and just go, oh, throw the arm out and get caught? But we would actually get to a point where we could just nasal breathe deep breathing to control it then use your like the you know your movements to kind of hold the frames to get into position and then work from there how do we start linking all this together because i can't believe we're at five minutes to go and i'm like what it feels like five minutes so we've got, we've got to do a round three we've got a three, oh four. i would i would love to man i would love to do it, it, it yes that's right I have a, a really good example of this. So uh, two of my best friends, uh, Kevin and Zach. Uh, Kevin came from a baseball background, and Zach is one of, came from a wrestling background. He's one of my old wrestling training partners. And so all three of us, we lift together almost every morning, and we also train jiu-jitsu. Now, Kevin didn't come from a wrestling background or any grappling experience, uh, but Zach did. And both of them, when I was telling them about nasal breathing and, and them being able to um, improve their performance if they focused on nasal breathing, both of them had some amazing results. Kevin had said that he recognized that with nasal breathing, he was able to think about what moves to do next and could actually like slow things down enough for him to think about the technique of the day that he just learned. Mm-hmm. And so he saw a lot of benefit from it because from a technical perspective, it gave him much more room to be able to focus on those things and begin applying some of the new things that he learned. My friend Zach, on the other hand, he has a lot of techniques from wrestling that he can use in jujitsu, but he realized that he was holding his breath a lot. He would, yep. he'd get really tense and start squeezing and holding his breath a ton. And when we talked about nasal breathing, he recognized that and he's like, gosh, I realize I've been getting so tired in jujitsu because I've been holding my breath half the time. And so when he focused on nasal breathing, he was able to relax a little bit more, be a lot more fluid in his techniques. And over the course of the long run, that definitely helped his jujitsu because when you're able to relax a little bit more and able to be more fluid in your movements, most of your jujitsu techniques are going to improve. There's so many jujitsu techniques that require you to be smooth and fluid. They're not all really explosive, big takedowns like what we would find traditionally in wrestling. And so being able to slow things down a little bit, focus on the nasal breathing, Mm -hmm. relax, not be too relaxed, but relax to a point where you can do the movements fluidly is definitely going to benefit you as well. Because it's something I did struggle with. Like I would just gas out and I'd be like, (laughs) oh, I'd hold my breath for people there. And they'd be like, you can breathe. Just you know, keep, keep, yeah. keep moving. And I think that's the point is we go in and you say to somebody, now frame, and they go, and they hold their breath because yeah. they've never been shown how to brace. They've never been shown how to tense. They've never. And this is why I'm so glad that there's somebody like you because you can actually show how to use conditioning properly, how to build the jiu-jitsu body, how to put it together and actually improve. And I think that's why people need to check out the Strength Matrix you know if we can ever get into it because there's so many people wanting it but yes sir before we get into round three because we're just touching the surface 
why should we go for the strength matrix? What should, what, you know, how can we follow you on Instagram and things like that? But how can we utilize your services? Because you're going to change the way Jiu Jitsu is trained. You're going to teach people how to become better grapplers, athletes, and people. But until we can get a third round in, how do we connect with you? And how do we use like the strength matrix, your Instagram and things like that? Absolutely, man. Yeah, you guys can follow me on Instagram at Joshua Selledge, or you can tune into my YouTube channel, which is just Selledge Strength or the BJJ Strength Coach. Either term in the search bar will, will bring my channel up. The Strength Matrix launched in January, and so we had limited registration at first just to make sure everything was running right, make sure the programs are sound. And now that we've kind of run that first test group through and they've had some just amazing results that – I could spend all day talking about how fired up I get seeing seeing some of the guys in there make some killer results. We're going to be – that being said, we're going to be opening things up for everybody. So by the time this podcast releases, you can go to www.thestrengthmatrix.com. You can check out some of the training programs we have to offer there. You can get, join the team. You can get plugged into the community, look at all the different stuff we have to offer. We have different training programs depending on your different jujitsu needs. So we have training programs if you're a competitor and you want to get ready and get in shape for a competition. You want to show up to that competition knowing fully well that you've been training hard, that you're physically ready, your strength is there, your conditioning is there your mobility is there and you can walk into that tournament ready to smash brackets and that's going to be the bracket smasher program we have some other training programs that you would that you could use to pair with your jiu-jitsu training if you're a competitor you can do this in your off season if you're not a competitor but you just want to build a little bit more muscle and get stronger for jiu-jitsu there's training programs for that as well and then we also have another training program called overtime which is we you know we've talked the towards the end here about conditioning if you're someone that's looking to improve your conditioning on the mat maybe your jujitsu training time is a little bit limited where you can only step on the mat maybe one two times a week but you want to work on your condition we have training programs for you as well you can find all that stuff at the strengthmatrix.com and like i said by the time this episode drops registration is going to be open for everybody anyone can come in and join the team i'd love to see you guys in there and i'd love to help you win more matches and get injured less Well, that's it for another week, and thank you for listening. It's now time to take what you've learned and use it to develop and enhance your life with the key points mentioned. Listen, try it, embrace it, use it, and crush it. Now's your time to hit that next level in your life. If you liked this episode, then please leave a comment on the show notes or a review of the show on your podcast platform. Everything helps evolve the show. Until next week, keep seeking the next level in your life.